Okay. Um, I think if that uh, if, uh, folks are ready, I might as well if we can get started. Uh, it's uh, so just go go ahead and continue to sort of introduce yourself in the in the chat. Hello to those um, uh, that are that are just joining us. Um, uh, but why don't we go ahead and get um, and get started with today's uh, webinar? We're very excited to be having a chance to introduce um, a new sort of the latest addition to the PKP family of software, Open Preprint Systems uh, Beta, uh, something that we just released on Friday alongside with the latest versions of Open Journal Systems and Open Monograph, uh, Open Monograph Press. Um, before we get underway, I just want to sort of do a few sort of introductions and some acknowledgments uh, of uh, the folks that you're going to be hearing from today, which is um, both myself. So I'm Juan Pablo Alperin. For those that don't know, I'm the Associate Director of Research with the Public Knowledge Project. I'm also an Assistant Professor at Simon Fraser University. Um, we've been uh, both, and then the second person that you'll be hearing from today is Alex Metcher, who's the Associate Director of Development, uh, really heads up the software development uh, team uh, and manages all of the, the work that we do with, with, the, with the software itself. Um, the way that we'll structure this today is that I'm going to do a bit of a presentation of uh, both what PKP and some of the specifics and things that really set open preprint systems apart from, uh, from other uh, software solutions that are out there and other projects that are out there. Um, and then Alec is going to really actually go into the software and we'll screen share and show you what the software actually looks like and how it operates, just a, an overview of what, that, of what uh, the software is. Um, before I, I get underway, though, with a bit of a presentation, um, I want to give a couple of acknowledgments. The first is to Cielo, who uh, not only provided some of the seed funding to get this uh, preprint software uh, underway, but really has been a partner in the development throughout from the very beginning, making sure that um, we are building software that is meeting the requirements of a global community, um, has really helped us to guide and develop the features that are in place, the, with the decisions that get made around its design, and so they've really been a instrumental partner in this, as well as having provided some of the seed funding to get things started. Um, uh, in terms of actual support, there's also an anonymous donor at Stanford who has, with an intense interest in global information access um, who has made contributions that made it possible for us to take on a new software development. Uh, so it's really you know, taking on a new application was a big decision for us at PKP, uh, and their generous contribution helped to make that possible. Um, I also want to acknowledge NTUC Nygaard, who is the, the software developer that really has been heading up the, the work on open preprint systems. So he wasn't able to join us today for this, for this webinar, otherwise we would have loved to have given him an opportunity to also share a little bit with you. Um, you know, in terms of it's the whole PKP team always that puts applications together, but really NTUC here is the, um, the person that re deserves the, the acknowledgement and the credit for what some of what you're going to see today in terms of actually putting the software together. Um, I want to start, again, I won't take up too long in terms of uh, talking about PKP in general, but I just want to give a bit of context because some of you are a little less familiar with, with uh, PKP and, and the work that we do. So I just want to give you a little bit of context on that. I know we're excited to get talking about preprints, and I, and I will try to get those and get to that as, as quickly as, as possible. But I just want to share a little bit of this background. Um, the first is that PKP for over 20 years now um, has been working with the mission of increasing the quantity and the quality of knowledge that's available to the public. I mean, it's right there in our name, and so that's not a surprise to anyone, but really it has been around making sure that we are supporting public knowledge and, and not just supporting it in terms of making sure that more things are available, but also trying to help to improve the quality of what's being put out there. Uh, and the second piece, which I think is just as important, and I, I think is something that is a, a, a key part of the identity of PKP, is so it's not just about increasing the amount of uh, content and knowledge that's out there uh, in general, but also it's about increasing the participation in who is whose knowledge is being put out there. And, and so making sure that there is high quality participation and that people are able to participate really on um, have a real opportunity to get uh, their voice, their knowledge, their ideas, their research and scholarly works out there from everywhere in the world. And this global element of PKP is something that I'm going to come back to in a little bit. Um, PK, how does PKP achieve this? We have sort of three pillars of our work uh, that are worth highlighting because they are all coming 
uh, in what we're going to talk about today around preprints and the preprint systems. Uh, people sort of think of this as being, uh, I mean, it is the core part of what we do is to provide open source software for anyone anywhere in the world to access it so that they can lower the barriers to creating, presenting, and sharing this scholarly content. And so the open source software is certainly a key piece of what PKP does. And it's probably the thing that those of you that have heard of PKP have probably heard of us primarily uh, because of the software that we do. Um, but it isn't the only piece of what, of what we do. And, and I think what informs the software that we create uh, is also research that we do into uh, scholarly communications. Uh, so research, uh, we do education, not just as teachers and as uh, professors, a handful of uh, two, you know, uh, both John Walensky and myself are, are in, in formal teaching roles, but really everyone on the PKP team has sort of this education role around um, helping to support the community in, uh, in good scholarly communication uh, practices. And we do advocacy around open access. So we are a project that's academically led uh, and we're part of that community ourselves. So we are, we are scholars or we are within uh, librarians. We are people that are embedded within academic institutions uh, and the project itself is embedded in an academic institution. So we have this uh, education mission, this research mission, uh, and we're not shy about doing advocacy towards more open scholarly communication systems. And the third pillar of what we do is that we provide publishing services. And so although I was, I'll talk, a lot of our software is intended for people to be able to host and run and take on themselves um, the publishing services. We have a publishing services division that helps to provide really high quality hosting services, but also preservation uh, and, uh, and indexing. So uh, we, we make sure that we're trying to support the community of people using our software as best possible by providing these services to them. And in a combination of these three activities and all three of these pillars uh, is how we try to achieve our, our goals. Um, like I said, most of you will be familiar with PKP because of open journal systems. I talked, I said I would mention again that we're a global project. I just wanted to sort of show briefly, these are estimates of number of journals. We have a sort of a, a ad hoc way of trying to count and keep track of where these installations are. Um, but most of you have heard of PKP and uh, maybe are familiar with us because of open journal systems, which is, you know, somewhere between nine, 10,000 or so journals um, around the world. And as you can see, really globally, uh, globally distributed. Um, and the way that we think that our software is helping is sort of supporting uh, to achieve this mission around helping to increase the quantity and quality of public knowledge and the participation. Um, one is that we think that the software is helping to lower the barriers of entry. It means other people that people that uh, anywhere in the world are interested in starting uh, a journal or now a preprint system are, are able to do so, which allows those more voices to be publishing and putting their content out there. That this we think that the software is helping to do that. Um, the software itself, itself is helping to streamline the publishing process, which is helping to lower the cost and is enabling people to actually make their contest open access. And so this is, uh, again, an important part of what has gone into uh, the reason we create the software, make it easier so that people don't need to invest so much in, uh, in their publishing process. They can, they can really uh, focus on increasing the quality of that content and making it available. The software has built into it a whole bunch of best practices, uh, not just around the quality of the metadata that's being collected, but also around workflows and how things are displayed, which again is helping to improve the quality of that work. Um, and the software itself, by making the metadata and all of its content sort of organized and available, make sure that it gets properly indexed, um, is uh, helping to improve the discoverability of that work and the circulation. So this, these are sort of the, the, some of the key ways in which PKP software itself is helping. And so the question, uh, I think, you know, we, like I said, we are, have a long history of doing uh, work with around journals uh, and, and that traditional form of publishing. And so one of the questions was why we should be moving into uh, making sure that we have a preprint software. I think a lot of you are here today because you probably have an interest in preprints. You're, uh, a lot of you are uh, actually already managing preprint communities or working with preprint communities. So maybe this is, again, things that you already know. But I want to just present a little bit of our view of some of, some of the, the opportunities that we think that preprints present. Um, the first is obvious, it's that to accelerate discovery. I, I think that you know, we're seeing right now in rapid response to an outbreak, the important uh, role that preprints are playing in making sure that uh, that scholarly and research uh, knowledge is being put out there quickly and in a, um, that's so that the community, the community can respond appropriately. But 
um, it's not just in these sort of times of emergencies or times of outbreaks. Actually, we think that uh, you know the discovery and speed of research circulation could be uh, could be improved um, in across all fields at all times, whether it's an emergency or a crisis uh, or not. And we think that preprints play a key role in doing that. The second, preprints also give us an opportunity as a community to experiment with new technologies. And so here I'm thinking things like, you know, web-based authoring, uh, web-based workflows and sort of document-centric workflows, being able to publish straight to HTML and, 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 and to, to uh, convert to XML and have all of these things that by not being wedded to legacy publishing systems, preprint servers and preprint systems uh, allow us to sort of start uh, thinking what would be the right technologies for us to be using to make sure we get this going. Uh, and the third is actually just to kind of reinvent scholarly publishing. If we were to think about to start scholarly publishing from the ground up, and it, well, I think preprints would probably be an important part of that. And, um, and supporting a preprint culture is giving an opportunity to the scholarly community to, to explore different models of evaluation, like open review, uh, and so on, that are sort of give us a chance to say, well, again, not being wedded to legacy publishing uh, practices and systems, um, what would we want to see in scholarly dissemination? And, and we think the preprints are an opportunity to do that. Um, and so, you know, we've seen preprints rise. Uh, and, you know, we've had some preprint systems that have been around for a long time. There's some new players in, uh, in place. There's new fields like in, uh, that are starting to preprint now. We've seen the rise of all of the new disciplinary uh, preprint systems that are, are out there. So there's a, clearly an interest in, uh, in uh, having preprints from our, around the scholarly community. Uh, and so why was a new preprint system uh, uh, sort of software necessary? What makes the open preprint systems from PKP different from the other software and platforms that are out there today? Um, I want to use that to, you know, before we get to actually getting into looking at the software and how it looks itself, I just wanted to highlight on what are, uh, again, just a few of those really key differences that differentiate uh, PKP's open preprint system from uh, virtually all of the other preprint uh, softwares that are being used today. The first is, uh, I say that I, you know, the, one of the things that distinguishes is who is behind this particular uh, software. PKP has a 20 plus year history of building software uh, with the community. Uh, we have never charged for our software. Like I said, we do provide hosting services, but our software itself is free. Uh, we have never charged for the support that we make available in the community's forum that we enable and, and that we actively respond to and that we are helping to sort of curate and support that community. Um, and we have a very long history of making our software work well with others. Our, our software really interoperates with a you know, every other player in the scholarly communication space. We have made sure that our software is not um, is part of an ecosystem and that we're supporting an open ecosystem that includes, um, that includes uh, others that are out there. Uh, and plus, I'll say as an academic-led project, you're guaranteed that we, we, you know, we're never going to be acquired by a commercial entity. So I would say that this is around our software sort of uh, is, uh, gives you that some kind of assurances that there is a long history and tradition of doing things in a way that the community has always been very, um, uh, very satisfied with. The second, though, even though we're behind it, uh, one of the things that distinguishes uh, PKP software, and, and I think this will be one of the things that will also characterize open preprint systems, is that who owns and operates it. Our software is built by us, but it is a primary, so it's uh, led by us, but our software is really built for the community to take, configure it, uh, customize it, and run it themselves. So it's, it's in the hands of that community. And so the thousands of journals, those installs, that map I showed you around the world, um, show that even though PKP guides the development, the community takes it and makes it their own. And so in this sense, the community is really in the hands of those people that are wanting to use it uh, in a very real way. It's, it's the software is being operated on their servers, controlled by them with their settings. We are not trying to have a hand in, in uh, in doing in doing that part of it, it's the community software to to own and operate. And the third thing that distinguishes PKP software, and that I think will distinguish OPS as well, is that who it's actually serving. Um, uh, and so the software is actually built with very serious considerations and uh, of, and recognition that scholarship is best when it's diverse and when it's global. 
Right? This is why we really make sure that our software can take into account different ways of operating, different, it can be configured in different ways to serve different needs, but also multilingualism has been a very serious consideration in how it's built, and we'll talk about that a bit more. And uh, accessibility is also things that we have uh, taken very seriously at PKP. Um, and you might be saying these are sort of high level things so about really what are the actual features in the software that distinguish it. So let me just talk about specifically about OPS, some of its uh, specific features. Um, OPS is super easy to install on very basic infrastructure. Any, time, any place where you can run a web application, you'll be able to run uh, OPS. It's very straightforward to get it going. We know that uh, anyone that can install a web application will be able to get OPS installed in a matter of minutes on virtually any server environment. This means that people can turn to their university libraries, their institutions, or anywhere uh, that they have access to for that kind of, uh, uh, for that support. Uh, the second that OPS is portable. If you need to change host for whatever reason, so the place where you had found to provide that home for OPS somehow is not able to do that anymore and you need to go somewhere else, well, you just have to you know, take those files for the application, take the content files, which is in a different folder, and move the database, Can change, update your configuration file to connect the three things, and you're up and running on a new host. You're not locked into any particular hosting service that, that you find. So it just uh, gives, gives you that peace of mind around that if, uh, you, know, if you found some place to, to be running your, your, your system, you're not going to be locked into that, uh, to that community. And again, this is by design from the get-go. From, uh, from, from our perspective, this is an important feature. The third, and going to that uh, global community that we're trying to serve, OPS is really, and, and this is actually true also of OJS, is that really uh, some of the only software for academic publishing that is truly multilingual. So OPS already, as of uh, Friday when it was released, OPS Beta, is already available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese with full translations. Uh, and because it shares so much of the library and so much of the code base with, with the other PKP suites, um, it will, it's also already partially available in another 15 languages, which means that the, uh, getting OPS translated into any of those other 15 languages will not be that labor intensive because part, a lot of the work has already been done. Um, and important here, and I want to just uh, make sure I emphasize this, is not just the interfaces that are available in those multiple languages, the content and the metadata for all in, in any of these languages can be uploaded within the system. The system you can configure to accept any of the languages that, are, that exist. And there you can now publish uh, abstracts and titles and all of the metadata in multiple languages. And you can enable uploading of content in, uh, in all of these multiple languages. Um, uh, that means that then that context, uh, that, that content will be indexed in those multiple languages correctly and made available uh, through other, uh, uh, anywhere where the content is English in those multiple languages. We're not assuming that English is gonna be the language of communication. If you're working in other parts of the world, you may be interested in having your content in other languages. We think this is a crucial part of scholarly communication being a global enterprise. Um, fourth is that OPS can be configured and extended. We understand that different communities have very different needs. Uh, in, in, in the context of preprints, we've seen this, for example, no two preprint communities that we've spoken to now wants to screen preprints in the same way. And so we've made sure that we can extend and customize the way that preprints are screened and what's allowed to be published. Uh, no one size fits all. This is, again, very specific built into the system. Um, we see customizations also in the way that things look. We have a, a plugin architecture that can also be used for theming and changing the look and feel of the preprint systems. Um, and lastly, and this is a, as another distinguishing feature, is that because it's built on top of you know, 20 plus years of working on open journal systems and it shares so much of the code base with open journal systems, um, we are sure that OPS is already implementing community standards and best practices. And so we'll see this in around the meta tags that, are, that appear on the published pages, things being available through OAI interfaces. Uh, we have um, uh, building things like the SORB protocol for depositing it into other systems. We are really uh, have a lot of experience that we're able to leverage from uh, 20 years of using OJS, and we're sure that OPS is implementing community standards and best, and best practices. Uh, I would say that these features sort of embody PKP's ideals of what open scholarly infrastructure 
look. And, and so here I invite the questions around like, you know, are any of these, are, is there anything else that you would want to see in open scholarly infrastructure? When we talk about community owned infrastructure, when we talk about open source community uh, infrastructure for scholarly publishing, um, we think that these sort of features are in some ways capturing what is our vision for what open scholarly uh, infrastructure should be and should, and should look like. Um, and I just want to sort of uh, take a, a moment here uh, just before I transition over to, to Alex doing the demo, um, is that in some ways because of the way that we envision open scholarly infrastructure and that we share some of these ideals with Cielo, uh, this is part of why Cielo uh, approached PKP uh, for building a preprint system instead of taking one of the preprint communities and, and platforms that already existed out there. There's a lot of similarities between what Cielo was looking for and, and OPS. And, and the reason I want to share this piece around Cielo is because perhaps some of this resonates with your organizations and your communities as well. But there was a lot of similarities between PKP and Cielo. We both have a 20 plus year history of working uh, in, in supporting open access. We both have sort of an interest in supporting a very diverse community that's multi, multinational, multilingual, and, and actually I should have added here as well, multidisciplinary. Um, um, we have openness and interoperability as key parts of our of our mission. And we both believe that in decentralizing services to let journals and portals sort of manage themselves. It, this idea that there shouldn't be uh, centralized, someone deciding what is the, the way that things should move forward, that really communities should be able to take these things and run them on their own. And so when they decided, as, as I think we also agree that preprints are a key component to open science, uh, it seemed that uh, PKP was a good a good partner to be able to do this. And again, you might, uh, you might agree that this resonates with your, your communities as well. And so they chose PKP because existing solutions, uh, in some ways by taking control of the preprint service instead of letting them run it themselves and control that or letting their communities have access to them, we're in some way we're taking away the autonomy or may have not been interoperable already from the get-go with uh, other software they're using such as OJS. Uh, and certainly very few other softwares out there were available for them to really support multilingual, uh, multilingual content. Okay, so that's enough of me talking and being out there. Uh, I, I'm sure that you're all keen and excited to actually see what this looks like in practice. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Alec now to um, take control of the, uh, sharing his screen so that he can get it going. Um, I'll say that I will now, once I've stopped sharing my screen, I'll try to start going through uh, your comments. If you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them in that chat window. Um, I, will I will try to answer them as Alec is presenting. Um, I may not be able to get to all the questions, but at least I will try to answer the ones that can be, that I can. Uh, and at the very end, if we have a bit more time, uh, we might be able to take a few more. Um, otherwise, questions will be well out. So I'll point you to where you might be able to ask the questions that don't get answered, but I'll try to do it. So just go ahead and ask uh, as Alec is presenting. Um, um, just go ahead and ask questions in the chat um, and I'll turn it over to him so that we can see what Open Proofing Systems beta looks like in practice. Hi everyone and thanks for the introduction Juan. Um, it's been a pleasure to see everyone kind of commenting on where they're in from on the, the chat. Um, I, we did a bit of a survey before the webinar um, to check to see what everyone's background was, why they were uh, coming to see this. And we asked uh, who was familiar with OJS and who was not. And I think about two thirds said they were familiar with OJS and about one third said that they were coming from a preprint uh, background. Obviously there will be some overlap between these groups, but our two big audiences are people who already know something about our software and then people who maybe don't, but uh, are interested in working with it for preprints. So I'm gonna to try to strike a balance between those two groups um, and equally bore the folks who know OJS and confuse the folks who uh, don't. <laughs> so anyway, let me just get my screen share started. Um, see if I can find the right window. And I'm going to present um, from a few different perspectives here. I'm going to begin uh, by looking at just the front end of the software. And then I'm going to show you what it looks like to, uh, to be an author and then uh, to work through um, the editorial process as maybe a, a manager of the system, and then go into the administration. So I'm gonna start from the simple stuff, uh, things you might see as a, as a scientist who's looking for a preprint, then into the writing process for an author, and then back into the administration. So I'll, I'll get successively more complicated here. 
Um, I want to point out a few things right from the start here. If you're familiar with OJS, this will look uh, very close to identical to what OJS uh, presents, uh, Open Monograph Press uh, by the same means, and that's intentional. Um, actually, all of these applications, OPS, OJS, and OMP, um, are built around a shared library that uh, provides a, a number of tools that we're building to facilitate scholarly communication as kind of an abstract process. Um, and then each application, say OJS or OPS, then takes and adds to that the specific concerns of publishing using a certain kind of publishing form. A journal article which uh, has, is concerned with publication and issues and subscriptions possibly, uh, access controls, all that kind of thing. Or in the case of OPS, um, there's much more of a flat publication model and we're more concerned with giving authors the tools to publish their own content. So just briefly, to look at what might um, help to organize a large amount of content, I've got some sample articles here, sample uh, preprints. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a couple of different series that are available to browse. These are obviously configurable by the, uh, the manager. And then we have also on the side here, uh, organization into categories, and these are likewise configurable. So I've got a uh, two-level hierarchy here. Uh, if you go into any one of these, you can see the uh, submissions within that uh, category listed. So you've got browsing tools, you've got searching tools, and uh, this is a very vanilla presentation. And what I mean is that it's not styled in any, any particular direction. And we do this with OJS as well and OMP because one of the things that you'll want to do if you're hosting your own copy of the software is to introduce your own brand. So we try to make this a very neutral container for that content. And then the same sorts of tools that you would use to style OJS, uh, such as theme plugins or CSS or, or what have you, are also available for OPS. So that's already a fairly well-worn ecosystem. If I look at a particular submission, as you can see, uh, I've got, uh, let's go back into the uh, landing page for it. I've got a very simple set of metadata here. You've got uh, the contributor, their, um, their institution. You might have ORCIDs here if those were entered. You've got uh, abstracts. You've got uh, some information about publication date. Um, this is a configurable set of data uh, based on the Dublin core set. And I've only got a few of these enabled and a few of them entered. So this is a very simple presentation, but there's obviously a uh, capability for much more. I'm going to go in now as an author, and I'm going to log in as an author who's already published with this, uh, this server, which I'll explain in a moment. I'm going to create a new submission. And uh, one made reference to multilingual capabilities. I'm going to point out a few of these as we go along, but uh, suffice it to say that there's a very rich set of metadata capabilities around uh, multiple languages. And so I could choose to submit here in, uh, in French as the primary language for this submission. And you'll see that even if I do choose uh, English in this case, there's still the option to add um, metadata in, in additional languages. I'll just jump through these fairly quickly. This is some boilerplate. Again, this can be chosen as part of the setup if you want authors to agree with a certain uh, set of terms. Um, it takes you fairly quickly to uploading a submission file. And I'm going to rush through that. Um, if you want to upload, it, typically authors will upload a single submission text, but as you can see here, there's a list of additional types of content. So you might upload a data set, you might upload uh, images and, uh, and so on. So if you do have uh, in a medical preprint server, um, a need to upload images as separate uh, content that can be um, configured here as well. So I'll just go in and upload a single file for preprint text. I use my usual dummy file. And then I'll be taken to the full metadata set for the submission. I mentioned that we chose English as our primary language, and we also have configured an option for French as a secondary language. So what I'll do is I'll enter uh, just the English title. Uh, much of this is optional, of course. Um, there is this uh, red globe icon here. The globe icon here means that you're able to enter content in multiple languages. This is optional. Um, the title field is required in the primary language, English in this, in this case. But if I wanted to, um, I could add a lang uh, title in a second language. And what you'll see is there's this green indicator that says that it's, it's available in all languages. I'll show you how this shows up later. Um, you can add additional contributors if you wanted to. Uh, these are then uh, able to um, both be published in the metadata, but also it's possible to have them participate in the workflow as well. Uh, I showed you the different content organization tools, and there was a list of different categories. 
Um, here you can choose as an author which categories you'd like to have this preprint added to for browsing purposes. Uh, and obviously all of these forms can be revised by the editor, by the manager, if they want to intervene in the content. And I'll talk a bit about uh, screening policies and how you'd permit the uh, author to self-publish versus when you'd have somebody intervene from the, the server. And that's it. Uh, in this case, there's only a single file, a single set of metadata. Uh, these notifications are because my email delivery is not set up because it's on my local laptop. You can ignore those. Um, but uh, here we have the opportunity for the author to proceed to publication. So now that the submission has been entered, it's viewable by the server staff if they do want to intervene. In this case, the author is able to go in and publish uh, by themselves. So now this is reviewing all the submission contents. Um, as you can see here, there's if you did have things like cross-ref support and DOIs enabled, there would be some indication of what the DOI was. Uh, there's an area here for discussions to take place um, between uh, people involved with the submission. But what I'll do is I'll just publish it. There. And now if I go into um, the reader's view, I believe this is the one I just created. And there it is. Now, I did uh, show entering a French title, and if I move the interface over to French on the sidebar here, this is now the French title I, I entered before. And you'll see here, in this case, uh, the metadata for the submission changed. That's what I entered as an author, but also the software is now obviously uh, moved over to being available in French. Um, all of our translations are community maintained, uh, thanks to our generous and very active community of, uh, of translators. And, um, uh, we have a new tool set we've launched to allow them to provide those translations. So if you're interested in translating the software into your own uh, language, this is the way you do it. And uh, the French uh, translation is incomplete, but the translator worked on it for uh, just a few days and was able to get uh, to the point where you can see it's quite functional. All right, uh, I'm going to do one more thing as an author, which is to go back to my submission and demonstrate uh, the versioning capabilities. And this is a new feature that you won't have seen in OJS unless you've um, upgraded already to the recently released OJS 3.2. Um, essentially, in previous versions of the software, um, if you change the title, the title was changed and that was the end of it. But especially in preprints, uh, but also in, in journal submissions and so on, it's important to track changes in metadata and to prevent, uh, sorry, to present um, previous versions so that you can see how a submission has evolved over time if it's been revised. So I'm going to create a new version of this publication. I'm going to uh, change, make a correction to the uh, abstract. And I'm going to publish it. Great, and now if I go into the submission again in the reader's view, I'll see here that I have now two versions listed. And this is the public view. So as a scientist, you'll be able to see here if you're reading the submission that it's been revised. Um, if that's a public publication of this. So if I can go back to the older version, I see here now there's the uncorrected abstract. There's a note here saying that it's been revised. Let me just take it back into English. The note here saying this is an outdated version. So you can read the most recent version. And there it is. So that, that feature is now available in OGS 3.2 as well. Um, but it's particularly necessary in something like a preprint system because you can imagine that authors are going to want to revise the metadata, the contents. There's much less of a control um, exerted by the uh, managerial staff of the server compared to like a journal article uh, in a, a published journal. All right, um, I'm going to move now into the editorial interface and show you what this looks like if you're running a preprint server. And then if you'll recall, uh, from there, I'll go into the administration side. So as this, is, this user account I've just logged into here is uh, the manager of the system. And you can see here, here's an indication of all the submissions that are uh, active in the system. There's a series of different queues here. Um, this is contents that, uh, submissions that I'm working on actively. There's submissions that have come in that are not assigned to anybody to work on. Uh, there's um, uh, more particularly here, there's the archive queue here, which is where the previously published content is. So um, what I'll do is take a look at any one of these and see much the same view that I saw before. I have access to uh, communicate with all those who are assigned to the submission. Here's a list of the folks who are active on this. Uh, there's a, a set of roles that come with the system. Uh, they're configurable, but uh, the default set's fairly usable. And um, there's also some automatic assignments made. So you may have uh, editors assigned to a series. And there's, in this example, there's two different series we've got set up, one called preprints and one called reviews. 
when you come in as an author, you're able to choose which one you're submitting to. And then uh, in some circumstances, the system will automatically assign uh, those editors for that series to the submission. So you'll imagine if you want to have a server running with lots of submissions, you won't want to have the assignments be done manually. Just to simplify things, you might have them go automatically to a, a series editor. So there's a whole tool set there um, available for preprint server as well. Um, this is the same view as the author saw, uh, that uh, they were able to um, revise and republish and so on. That's also obviously available to the, uh, the manager here, the editor who's working with the content. We have a whole series of audit tools, like there's an activity log here. You can see what's been done with the submission. Um, somebody was asking on the chat about uh, linking a preprint to a journal article that it's been um, incubated into, and that's the relations tool set here. Um, Right now, you can designate, and this is available on the public view, whether the preprint's been submitted for publication, uh, that it's been submitted, uh, and that it's been published. And so uh, we're going to um, continue to work with this tool set here. This is, I believe, a, a vocabulary that's coming, it's inspired by Crossref's work. So we're shooting for compatibility with various systems here. And eventually, we'll be able to indicate uh, that the submission uh, started out as a preprint, was published here, and then uh, was turned into a journal article. And there's the DOI linkage. So this will now be presented on the front end of the uh, submission. So somebody who comes across a preprint uh, can follow through to the finally published article that it's then uh, turned into. Um, the means for transmission of a submission from preprint system, the preprint server into a journal article, uh, there's many of these options that are available. The one that we're focusing on is the SWORD protocol, which is a third party standard that you can use to transmit a submission from one system to another one. So uh, there is support in the preprint system for the SWORD protocol to be used as an editor or as an author to move a submission from preprint server into something else that supports SWORD. And then in OJS, there's support for the SWORD protocol to receive a submission uh, via SWORD. So uh, these don't have to be um, running on the same server or anything. You can take a submission from any preprint server and move it into any uh, OGS installation or anything else that supports SWORD, as long as those plugins are available. Um, I'm going to move on to the administration side of things. And I want to just uh, focus a bit on the content organization tools that I showed at the very beginning. If you'll recall, um, I had different series here, I had different categories here, and uh, then there was a different set of metadata for each submission that was available. In this case, there's very little. I'll just show you how some of those options can be made um, uh, more, more rich and how they've been set up in this case. So I'm going to go into the settings here and look first at the series. Um, if you'll recall during the submission process, I was able to choose from two different series. Here they are. Uh, there's two that have been, that have been created, preprints and reviews. Um, against those, I've designated uh, two different editors for this one and one for this one. So that configures the automatic assignments. But of course, I can create any series I want. Um, different policies, different word counts, whether it requires an abstract, uh, who the series editor, editors are, and so on. Uh, on the content organization side for categories, that's um, these, sorry, these options here on the sidebar. Those are configured here. So we have physics within that. We've got cosmology, particle physics, uh, biology has got evolutionary biology and botany. Those I just took a moment and filled in myself by filling in this form to create them. And then if you'll recall, when the author submitted a submission, they were able to choose which ones they wanted. If you wanted to have a, um, an editor curate these uh, rather than the author submitting, then it's possible, of course, for the editor to, uh, to correct or modify or assign these. Um, just to show you an example of the multilingual capabilities, I just grabbed um, a quick description from Wikipedia for each one of these and threw it in in both English and French. If I now go into the front end and go into physics, there's a description, and I can flip it over into French and get the French description. Uh, you can also list the subcategories and browse to them. All right, uh, moving a bit more into the uh, back end side of things. One thing that we've spoken a lot about with folks that are interested in using uh, the preprint server is uh, screening and the policies that are required that, that permit or forbid an author from publishing their own content. Um, obviously, if you simply say anybody can publish anything whenever they want, then your server becomes a, a bit of a, a trap for spam. And of course, if, if you have uh, crossref and preprints, uh, sorry, crossref, crossref and DOI configured, if you're allowing anyone to go in and publish anything they want and it results in a DOI getting minted, then there's a potential cost to you. So obviously, you'll want to think hard about what sorts of policies you'll uh, require your authors to uh, conform to before they can publish, before they can start minting DOIs and all that sort of thing. 
but we weren't able to come up with a uh, kind of universal set of policies on that. So uh, one made reference to the extensibility of the software and also the use of plugins. This is one of those examples. I'm just gonna flip it back to English. I've spent so much time writing this software, I almost don't even see which language it's in anymore. I just click where I know the button is. Okay, um, so uh, by default, Open Preprint Systems does not allow authors to self-publish. Uh, it requires that the submission is created by the author and then that the, uh, the manager or editor come in and uh, approve the content, maybe approve the, um, uh, the metadata and review the submission to make sure it's appropriate, and then they can press that button to publish. But if you'll recall, when I did the test submission, the author did have the right to self-publish. And the reason for that is because we have a plugin installed called the default screening plugin. And this is a, a third-party plugin. This is written by NTUC Nygaard as an example of a way that a plugin can introduce a specific screening measure. And the rule that this one introduces is that the author can only publish if they have a prior publication on the same server. So I was logged in as a, a, an author called Zeta Woods. Zeta already had a submission that was approved on the server for publication. And because that was already in place, there's assumed to be kind of a trust relationship with that author. So they were able to publish a, a secondary submission. But if I went in and registered as a new author, I would have to, uh, to, uh, to send the submission in and then somebody from the press of the server would have to come in and uh, approve it for a publication. Thereafter, with the trust relationship established, then the author could come in and do it themselves. So that's just one example of a, a screening plugin. And I would imagine that as we speak with more and more different groups, uh, they may write their own plugins. We have an ecosystem available for plugins. Um, some of these are our plugins. These are uh, ones that we've written. Some of them are third-party plugins. Um, and if you've used OGS, you'll be familiar with this ecosystem. Um, our hope is that uh, as open preprint systems um, gets used more broadly, groups will come up with their own policies for these kinds of things and then uh, make those plugins available uh, for the community to take on. So there'll be a, a series of options for you to use to meet your own requirements. And there's no single imposed policy that, uh, that we have to choose um, that wouldn't be right for everyone. Um, I mentioned SWORD, uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's going to be plugins here to allow for authors and editors to move their submissions from uh, preprints, the preprint server into an institutional repository, maybe an OGS journal, maybe a third party journal that also supports uh, the SWORD protocol. Um, I, I one made reference to things like OIPMH and best practices. Um, the last thing I'll just mention is that these are all built into the system. And just to show you uh, a couple of examples, um, if I look at the, where is this now? The metadata options here. Um, there weren't many options on the submission form for metadata, but if you want to use more of a Dublin core set that authors could, uh, could approve and enter um, metadata into during their submission, they would just uh, enable these various options. You can choose for each one of them whether you ask the author to provide the metadata or in fact require them to. Uh, so that's the full set available here. That'll be familiar to you if you're used to working with uh, OJS. And then on the other side, uh, the OI PMH interface. And I'll just throw the URL in there so you can see the example. Um, here's the OAI feed for those submissions. Um, I will leave it at that. We have a few minutes. We're going to try and wrap it up at uh, 10 o'clock. So we have 15 minutes to take questions. And I've not been watching the chat, but I believe Juan has. So maybe Juan, I'll pass it back to you to wrap a few things up. And then we'll see if we have time for a couple of questions as well. Great, uh, thanks, Alec. Um, I have been, I think, for the most part, uh, been able to stay and uh, continue to answer questions in the in the chat, which I'll sort of keep open here. I just posted a, um, I just, I think, if you're seeing my screen again now, uh, a few useful links for you to be able to to touch um, and to sort of read a little bit more or to start seeing. Um, uh, but I think I will continue to sort of have uh, questions coming in in the chat. And Alec, if you can also just keep an eye on, on those as I'm trying to speak and read those at the same time. Um, but I want to uh, so first just show these links up here just so that people know uh, and see where they can go to continue to learn more and to maybe even download. Uh, so the beta version, this is uh, uh, important to stress, this is the first release, as you're able to see, because it leverages so much uh, of the... Um, code from OJS. It's already, even though it's a very initial release and it's our 
it's sort of our version of a minimum viable product. It's already really robust and it's so complete because it has so much borrowed from the, the long history of OJS. Uh, but it is a, a first release, and so but it's available for you to to download from pkp.sfu.ca slash OPS. Um, from that page, also, you will find the link to uh, both a demo and a test drive install. So the demo, you can just see sort of the public facing. The test drive install, you'll be able to log in and, uh, and change the configurations. Keep in mind that the test drive means anybody is able to do that. So configuration, uh, people might be changing things. And, and also, we occasionally will reset that will delete everything that's there and reload it. Um, I also invite you to read a little bit more about uh, the sort of the history of having how we got to preprints. And, and there's a guest post, uh, there's a post from us and a post from Cielo already. Uh, and then lastly, uh, some of the research that uh, my research group at the Scholarly Communications Lab uh, um, have been doing around studying preprint metadata of existing servers. This is part of the, like said, the PKP doing both research and development, and this is sort of part of the research that uh, has also informed some of the decisions that we have made in, in, uh, in OMP, uh, sorry, in OPS. Um, I will show you before I sort of look to see if there's any questions or turn it to Alec to answer any questions that are there. I just want to show you that Alec showed you this very, uh, it's a very plain or we call vanilla version of, of OPS in that it's a, just very uh, plain and straightforward. Um, and OJS, when you look at it, at its default uh, theme also looks very similar. I just want to sort of quickly flash through a few of uh, OJS installations that are out there just to show the extent to which OJS can, uh, OPS will be able to look so different with, with some customization work and uh, a new theme plugin. So just to, I'm just going to flip through a few of these. I just want to sort of show you, you can kind of get the sense of that same basic general structure here, but a very different sort of looking theme in terms of uh, color fonts uh, and layout, right, of a few of the different portals that, that are out there that can give, um, that will be able to give OPS a very different uh, look and feel. Um, like I said, they, they, they vary quite a bit in what's, in what's out there. Um, this is maybe uh, sort of very uh, more serious ones to some that can be a little more fun and, and bold and drastic out there. So um, just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense that I don't want people to take away that o OPS needs to look uh, exactly that way. Uh, this is one of the huge differences between the 3.x line and the 2.x line of uh, PKP software is the ease with which themes can now be created and the look and feel can be, can be customized. Um, so uh, I've, I've tried to answer a few of the questions that have been coming up in the chat. I, I, will, um, I, I will not try to both read and answer questions simultaneously. I think we can probably just let people uh, go off, but I will stay in the chat and, and finish answering questions in the chat as soon as I, I stop talking. Um, I, uh, it's been really exciting to have a chance to share these, uh, this with you today. I think that uh, OPS is sort of coming at a time when the community uh, is, uh, has been shown that an interest to embrace preprints and, and a desire. And I think by the interest in, that we've seen in this uh, webinar, it shows that there was maybe an appetite for seeing uh, an open preprint uh, solution uh, come. And so we're excited to see where the community takes us and where, where you guide us to develop next. Um, we'll be listening to how you want to use the software, what features you want to see, um, and we'll be continuing to, to put this out there as we, and you can expect to see at least one preprint uh, server using OPS, which is from Cielo, uh, by uh, estimated sometime around the middle of this year. Uh, and hopefully we'll see other preprint communities uh, also uh, embrace, take the software, take ownership of it, and tell us where we should go next. So. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for taking the time to join us today. Um, we'll share um, a link to everyone that registered. We'll send out a link to a recording of today so that if you want to share it with others, you can do so. Um, and that will be available also for anyone that might have, that might have missed it. So um, thanks very much uh, for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your days.